this morning. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We come in the precious name of Jesus, ready to lift him up, ready to glorify him. Our souls thirst for your presence, God. We desire to be near to you and have you draw near to us and do the things that only you can do to set our hearts at rest, give us peace, to give us joy, to fill us up with the power of your spirit. Well, Lord, would you meet us here as we gather in your name? We love you and we praise you. You're welcome here in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship Jesus this morning. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great things.
praise you, God. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. You love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. My shame was a reason he would believe. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes all. Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But here it comes. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began.
praise you, Jesus. You set us free. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Set free. Praise you, Lord. Blessed be your name, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, the, the Bible is filled with the promises of God's goodness. It's filled with Him saying He'll watch over us, that He cares for and loves us, that He wants what's best for us, and then demonstrating that over and over and over again. You know, promises. And God's promises are real. Political promises, you know, not so much. Sometimes your friends don't always follow through. Moms and dads, sometimes we even, in our best efforts, don't get there. But our Heavenly Father, all His promises are yes and amen through Jesus Christ. One of the promises, one of the promises of God's Word is that through Jesus there's healing for us. Through Jesus, there's strength for us in times of need. I prayed yesterday with Dick Acreage at the hospital, and we just believed God that he would answer the prayers we had according to his great power. There's nothing he can't do. And while a lot of people can look and make pronouncements, this is not good, this is going the wrong way, it'll never work, it'll never happen, God's promises overrule all of the impossibilities that we come up with. Maybe this morning you've got an impossible in your life. You know, something that's happening uh, that is out of your control, it's, it's, it's too big for you. Your bank account won't fix it. All your friends coming together can't affect it. None of your great ideas and, and things you found on social media just won't affect it at all. But we serve a living God. We serve a God who cares about you. We serve a God who's promised to never leave us or forsake us. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to take just a moment, and we're going to ask God to meet us here. And if you've got a need like that, something that's impossible, and listen, don't, don't make it according to my standards of what impossible are. If in your life it just seems too big, Abel, if it's like, hey, it's bigger than me, it doesn't matter what I think or anyone else thinks. You take that to the Lord Jesus this morning. You trust him for it. We're going to just lift up. The Bible says, when we read in, in Psalm 63, that in the face of a powerful, amazing God, I will lift up my hands in worship. This morning, I want to challenge you. Would you do that as we pray? Would you lift up your hands to honor him? Lift up your hands in surrender. Lift up your hands in worship. And let's believe today that God will meet needs as we come to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that your promises are complete. They're whole. There are nothing left out. That through Jesus Christ, everything has been accomplished so that our needs might be met and your promises fulfilled. We come to you today standing on some of those promises. Promises for health and healing. Promises for provision of every need. Promises to be with us in our weakness to show yourself powerful promises that we'll never be alone. We'll never be alone without you. And Lord, I just agree with my brothers and sisters in Christ today. I ask you in Jesus' name to help them. Would you meet needs here today? Would you show yourself faithful? Would you make miracles happen here today, Lord. Today we pray for our friends Josh and Andrea Holder. We pray that you'd protect Andrea in particular as she's there in that New Orleans area. As a storm comes ashore, that you'd be with her. Protect her in Jesus' name. Not just her, but the people that they minister to. Would you Reach out your mighty hand to protect them. Help them, Lord. The people of that city, let them know that your hand was upon them. Lord, we pray today for 
Dick Acreage that you'd touch his body and bring healing to it. God, I pray that would be a strong and powerful witness to him of your love and concern for him and what's happening in his life. Be with Susie as well, Lord. Be with Lois Mills today. promises that be seen as complete.
worship Jesus this morning. Tell him of his great faithfulness in your life. Begin to recite examples to him. And as your spirit, as the spirit rises up within you, just rejoice in him. Hallelujah. in prayer just giving thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness but will you not just let it be a just a a prayer that you observe but will you make it your own prayer of God's faithfulness and your gratitude for that as she prays praise you God God even when we don't believe it and we don't see it and we don't think it that doesn't make it any less true that you are always faithful that your love for us runs deeper than any doubt we may ever have. God, in the uncertainty that we live in on a daily basis, I pray that we would always stand on your truth. Yes, Lord. Jesus, you're the word of life, and your word is true, and I pray that we would remember that daily, moment by moment, as we enter into times of worship together and as we enter into the remainder of the service and as we enter into our lives this week, may we hold on to the truth that you are and that your word is because you are always faithful and you don't leave us behind. You meet us where we are. And I pray that we would remember that this week. Thank you for who you are, Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Let's take a moment. Get from where you are and just greet someone. Be an encouragement to someone today. Maybe you've got a word or just a smile, the joy in your heart that will be with the thing they need today.
All right, as you find your way back to your seats, just want to say one more time this morning, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, if you're watching online, we're glad you're here as well. I know that was a, one of those scrambles this morning, Pastor Phil. It was one of those last-minute things. Oh, no. But we are good. We're online. We're streaming today. Uh, we're actually looking. We've had some issues the last couple of weeks, a little bit. We're looking at ways to rectify that, maybe get a little more bandwidth and have a little more stability. But we are glad that you're with us out there as well. Uh, it's a great day. If, if you like summer, this has been an amazing week of heat and humidity. Can you say a good amen for living in Illinois. Listen, 17 weeks from now, there'll be snow and ice, and you'll be hating that. So just take what you can get. Let me share a couple of things that are coming up this way, and I've just kind of got a word for you at the end of it. Obviously, we've got our Bible study on Wednesdays um, this week as well. Pray for Lois. She's going to have a procedure tomorrow. Pray that all goes well, and she can get some healing for her heart. Um, in a couple of weeks, we've got our, our 2021 church picnic. We pushed it back a little bit, hoping we can avoid a little bit of the humidity and stuff. And, and uh, Bill has said that he would provide air conditioning for all the pavilion outdoors. Uh, so um, we want and we're, invite you to come along, and we're going to have a great time. We'll have the sandwiches and drinks provided, and you all bring something to share. Bring a, a dish uh, to pass, a dessert to share, and it'll be a great time. I can't cannot wait. That's one of my favorite days of the entire year. We're doing some stuff with kids, so there'll be activities for them as well. You don't want to miss it. And then on Tuesday, September 21st at noon, we're having our our annual, I can't say it's an annual grandparents lunch because it's taken on different forms in the last couple of years, but our annual grandparents gathering, we want to honor grandparents. So if you're a grandparent, we'd love to have you come. We're going to have lunch. And uh, someone has said that was in the bulletin, there will be no fish gravy. Um, not this year, because we're having lunch, not brunch. So no fish gravy this year. Sorry if you're disappointed. But we want to ask you to sign up so we can be sure and have enough for everyone. I just want to speak to one thing, and then I'm, we're going to get right to the word this morning. Um, most of you know by now, uh, tomorrow there is a renewed mask mandate uh, that will take place here in, in Illinois. I don't care if you like it or not. It's, this is not the time or the place for we can have that after after church and we can talk about how we feel about the politics of it but we want to talk about the reality of, reality of it here in the local church uh, and I just want to say this I want to encourage us to approach this as you did so well um, months ago when we had a similar thing going on in our state um, you were all respectful of and loving for one another and what we're going to do in the church is what we did then. Uh, if, if you want to mask and, and feel it necessary to mask for your own health or the health of others, we're going to respect that, okay? Um, I don't have anything to say about it. I'm not going to point you out and say, Casey hires. We're not going to do anything like that. And I say we, I'm inclusive. That's the inclusive we. Is that fair? So Abel, it's all, all of us are going to be res respectful and loving. And on the other side of it, um, you know, you may not agree with people's choices, but we're going to love each other because this is the church of Jesus Christ. And we are going to show love and courtesy toward one another. Listen, I'm so proud. Pastor Phil, uh, my church has not had issues. We've been blessed. We haven't argued. We haven't fought. We haven't had that I know of people leaving the church. We have, we've, we've been disciples of Christ about this, and I'm so grateful for that, and it gives me a hope going forward, no matter what comes. I know you all handle it well, but I just wanted to encourage you with those words. That's how we'll handle it going forward. If there's a need further on to make different steps, we'll do that. We'll do it prayerfully, but that's how we will handle it going forward. Now, I'm blessed this morning. How many know that um, pastors need to hear the Word of God preached? And that pastors need a pastor too. Um, it's it's real. It's true. Um, I have learned over the years in both directions that sometimes we need someone who will encourage us, someone who will help us sort out what's wise and what's not wise, and sometimes someone who'll give us a little a little kick of encouragement to get moving forward. Um, our guest this morning has at times done all three of those for me. Uh, Pastor Phil Schneider has been the district superintendent for the uh, churches in Illinois for how many years? Is it nine? Wow. 
you know, that's good when it seems like that's a lot. And, you know, I, if it was two, oh my goodness, that's been the longest two years of my life. That would be bad. Nine and a half years Pastor Phil has served as in many roles, but I look at him as my pastor, and I can reach out to him and, and have on occasion and said, hey, help, what should we do? Um, any words of advice, and he always responds in that way. So Pastor Phil is going to come. He's been here. It's probably been five or six years we were talking since he was here and in this pulpit. He's going to come and bring the word this morning, and I just ask you to give him a Rock River Christian Center welcome as he comes. Pastor Phil Schneider. Well, I, uh, I appreciate that, and what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen? I praise the Lord. I'm just so glad to be here and so glad to see all of you. And uh, I, you know, you always wonder, you know, when someone comes to preach, you, you always wonder, are they any good? Don't, come on, now, you've, don't tell me that. You've sat there, and when the pastor introduces someone, you've thought to yourself, oh, dear Jesus, let them be good or really fast, one of the two, <laughs> and uh, I, I trust, I tell you, I have, uh, I have felt that before in my life uh, as a pastor, and Pastor Brian can tell you this, I've invited, you know, uh, missionaries to come speak or stuff, and you get up and two minutes into it, you're going, please God, send them back to the field, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So I hope this morning that you're not disappointed, but we are going to share the word of the Lord, and uh, that's never disappointing. Amen? Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Exodus, to the book of Exodus. We're going to be taking a look uh, here at the word of the Lord, and I just want you to know today uh, that uh, if, if you're a note taker, I just want to encourage you to go ahead and, uh, if you would, uh, just go ahead and number 1 through 15, because I've only got 15 points to my sermon this morning. So go ahead and turn to your neighbor and just say, there goes lunch, I tell you. I... No, I, I, I will not. Uh, I'm not going to preach all 15. Uh, a couple of... Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I was reading through the Bible in Exodus chapter 17, and I came across this passage. You know how sometimes you look or you read something, and it's like, man, that's great. That's, you know, and you, it's just automatically, my wife loves to read. She, you know, she reads these Christian romance novels, and I, I tell you, those things are horrible. And... Uh, and I like to read. I like to read fiction books and biographies, and I got people that I, I love to read their stuff. And, and, but sometimes when you read, it's so engrossing. It just draws you in, and it's like, wow, that really spoke to me. And in this passage, uh, I, I just came across some things that really spoke to me from the book of Exodus. Now, I, I looked up to see what I preached the last time that I was here. Anybody remember what I preached the last time I was here? No. <laughs> Jesus was there, but anybody, anybody remember? I got a $100 bill if you do remember. Uh, no, I, I already, <laughs> you had your chance to raise your hand. <laughs> it's, uh, I, last time I was here, I, approached, I preached about Moses coming out of the promised land and leading the nation of Israel. And when they came to the mountain of God, the Bible says that the Lord called Moses and the elders up onto the mountain. And then he called Moses and Joshua to come up further onto the mountain. And then he called Moses to come up a little bit higher. And that when he came down, the Bible said he glowed. Such a, that the elders of Israel said, Moses, please put a mask on. No pandemic jokes. Moses, please put a, something over your face because the glow of the presence of God. And I, I preach the fact that you and I never have to stay down in the lower area, that God always welcomes us, that Jesus, now see, there you got me, that Jesus has held out the scepter, that our Father has held out the scepter and welcomed us into his presence. And we can always be able to say, I have come from the presence of the Lord. 
Lord. But before they got to the Mount Sinai, there came to a place, they've left the promised land, and they are running out of water. Verse 8 of chapter 17, then Amalek, and, oh, what happens is they complained to Moses, and they said, Moses, we're thirsty. And Moses goes, and the Lord tells him to do what? To strike the rock. And when he does, a river of water begins to flow in the desert. We pick up the story in verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. There's all kinds of things here that I see in this passage when they're coming out of Egypt. They faced test after test, and sometimes they were successful, and sometimes they failed. But what I love about the whole thing of the story is this, is that even though they failed time and time again, they still made it to the promised land. You know, there are times in our life when we fail and we think that our failure has disqualified us. I might as well give up. I might as well throw in the towel because I failed and God's never going to welcome me. But yet here the nation of Israel, an entire nation of people who complained and griped the entire journey, who failed time after time, and yet God still leads them to the promised land. Never let failure disqualify you. They test the, the will of God. They're, here they are, they're, uh, earlier in chapter 17, verses 2 to 4, it says they quarreled with Moses. They said, give us water to drink. And Moses said, why are you quarreling with me? Why are you blaming me? Why are you putting the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty and they grumbled. Sometimes God takes us to dry places or pandemics to show us his power. Have you ever wondered, why doesn't my life always go perfectly? Why does my brother that you mentioned, why is he sick? Why do these things happen to us? Sometimes these happen to us so that God can show us his incredible power. If nothing in our life ever was difficult and nothing in our life ever went wrong, how would we know the power of God to deliver us and help us and keep us? Sometimes God leads us to those dry places because he has something in store for us that he wants to show us. There's a, a, a lot more here. There's always surprises on the journey. Sometimes we have to experience the power of God's presence in a, in a dry place. Your physical provision is never enough. You can't pack enough water for the journey. You'll never have enough. I'm, I'm getting close to that retirement age, that golden age of retirement. Everybody who is on this side of retirement calls it the golden age of retirement. Everybody who's on this side of the age of retirement says, it ain't so golden. <laughs> And I'm reading all these things about retirement, about how much money you should have, and about how, and I read a great comment on one of these little articles, and the comment was this, you'll never have enough. And it's true. You'll never have enough for the journey. But God has water stored up for you, hidden in rocks that no one else has ever seen. You know, I know that God knew that Israel would be at this place. And I believe that God stored up water in the middle of a rock 
in the middle of a rock face of a, of a mountain. Here they are on this hill. And at the base of the hill, there's a rock face. And I believe that God stored up a river of water just waiting for Israel to come by. And God knows the journey that you're on. He knows where you're going. And he has things stored up for you all along the way where he's going to show you his power. On that journey, sometimes we face dry places, but that's okay, because God's going to show up. We've all experienced the moment where God told us to do something, and we thought, that's just silly. I, I can remember as a teenager, you know, feeling that I should respond to an altar call, and sitting there and saying this, Pastor Bob, uh, God can hear me right here in my seat just as well as he can 18 feet up there at the altar. You know what I'm talking about? That moment where it's like, I don't need to, I can just do it right here, you know. And, and yet here, God says to Moses, what? Go strike the rock. Does that make sense to anybody here? Do you find that in any scientific manuals, uh, you know, that if you will strike a rock, water will flow out of the middle of it? No, but God calls us to obey, sometimes even when it doesn't make sense. But if we'll do it, God will supply for us. Well, here are the six points I really wanted to talk about this morning, and I'm just going to fly through them, so we're going to do great. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. The first thing I want you to know is this, is that when God is doing something new in your life or in our church, the enemy will always come to steal the miraculous work and supply of God. Here, water is flowing in the desert. I want you to know there are no rivers in the desert, but God has miraculously started a river that fed all that satisfied the thirst of all of Israel, of all of their animals, of all of their flocks. It is a mighty river of God that is flowing out of this rock face. And But when God miraculously supplies for you, when God's doing something new in your life or in our church, the enemy will always come to steal what God has tried to supply for you. When God's blessed you and answered your prayer or God has done something for you, the enemy will always come to try and steal it or destroy it. What does the New Testament say? The New Testament says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to steal the life, the abundant life that God has promised for you. The enemy's very purpose is to keep us from the miraculous provision and plan of God. Here, I, again, I believe that God had planned for a river of water to come out of that rock for the nation of Israel. And Amalek hears about this river, and they come to steal the water. They come to steal the provision of God. God's got a plan for you. But the enemy wants to destroy that plan in your life. God has a plan for Rock River Christian Center. But the enemy wants to destroy that. Wants to steal, kill, and to destroy. God knew that people would have to journey into the desert. And he planned this miraculous place of supply. But the enemy comes to steal the supply. Don't be surprised when battle, battles arise in your life. When the enemy tries to take everything that God has for you, maybe it's a physical provision that God has for you, a new job. Maybe it's a spiritual provision. You're just feeling an extraordinary sense of the joy of your salvation. You have a new hope that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, but the enemy will always come to steal it and take it away from you. How many of you have seen that Capital One credit card advertisement that says what's in your wallet let me ask you a question what is it in your life that the enemy wants to steal is it your health is it your joy is it your devotional life is it the uh, the, the the blessings that God has given you what is it in your life that the enemy would want to steal that God has provided for you. I want you to know that we can pray and believe God to keep the enemy at bay. The second thing is this, is sometimes we have to do our part. God requires partnership and participation. 
Did you know that God requires us to participate? Oh, man, sometimes it's so easy to sit back and let everybody else participate while we enjoy the blessing. What, did, what, what does this passage say? To you go prepare an army. I will go stand on the top of the hill of, with the staff of God in my hand. The New Testament shows us this principle in this way. The disciples were involved in most of the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they fed the 5,000, what were the disciples doing? Making the people sit in groups of 50. They were passing out the food. They were gathering up the remnants. They were doing all of these kinds of things. So many times, the disciples are participating in the miraculous. The supply was miraculous, but Israel was given an assignment. You ever wonder why God just didn't wipe out the Amalekites himself? Oh, God, you've given us this wonderful supply of water. Now these people are coming to steal it. God, kill them. And God says, I've got a job for you to do. You guys, go, you guys go fight. You guys go up on the mountain. You guys gather swords. You guys go up and lift up your hands in intercession to the Lord. Everybody had an assignment because God requires participation. No one escapes the battle. Do you know that this is the first time Joshua is mentioned? This is Joshua's first assignment the first time that he comes to the forefront and what does he come to the forefront as hey you go fight hey you go hit him in the face boy don't you wish sometimes God would give you that command <laughs> hey you go beat them hey you 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 go and destroy no God requires a partnership and participation Moses and elders have to climb the mountain. The Lord was in the valley as well as on the mountain. Do you know the Bible says that God is training us to rule and reign with Christ? And you usually learn to rule and reign with Christ when you're participating and you're doing something. One of my kids, Renee and I, we had five kids in six years. And that's pretty easy to explain how that happened. And I know some of you are sitting there going, no, we know how it happened. It's pretty simple. We, our, our first son, our second son, our third son, our fourth son, and the princess. She was last. And, uh, you know, so we, we had five. One of my kids, and I, I, don't, I don't want to say which one because I don't want to embarrass Philip, but one of my kids <laughs> never liked getting his hands dirty. He, he just, he had this fascination with his hands being clean, and never liked to get his hands dirty. And so one day I was, I was burying some, uh, some piping for our gutters in our yard. And so I'm out there and I'm digging the ditch. And I, you know how I, sometimes you just get perfect inspiration. And I thought, I need to get that kid out here with me. And so I had him come out and I had him using his hands to scoop the loose dirt out of the bottom of this little ditch. And the whole time he's doing it, he's looking up at me like this. And I'm just like, oh, this is great. <laughs> I'll never forget what I said to him that day. I said, son, you better go to a college for a long, long time or else you're going to be di digging ditches for the rest of your life. <laughs> Well, six years of college later, he did what I told him to do. But God requires us to participate, to do our part in the work of the kingdom of God. Sometimes it's easy to sit back and let pastor lead in worship, and, and we're singing and worshiping, and it's easy for you to enjoy the blessing while you just sit back and let the participation of others bring the flow of the Spirit of the Lord. God requires us to participate. Number three, the war is won on the spiritual plane. Whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. It's, it's, it's really pretty simple. When Moses felt fresh, he worshiped, he interceded, he prayed, he held up the staff of God. But when he, how old is Moses? He's older than me. He's 80 years old. And whenever he gets tired and his hands come down, Amalek prevails. I don't care. There are times when I get tired. Anybody here in their 40s? Is there times when you get tired? 
Anybody here in their 20s? Is there times when you get tired standing out in the middle of the sun up on the mountain and you're watching? Oh, my goodness. But the war is won on the spiritual plane. Victory for the church is won in the place of intercession. Here's what the Bible says in the New Testament. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The battle is fought on the spiritual plane. I find it interesting that God's not even looking to see what happens in the valley. He's looking at the elders to determine the outcome of the warfare. Think about this. Israel had never been, none of the people of Israel had ever been in a battle in their lifetime. None of them. None of them were ever trained as, as in, in an army. None of them were ever trained in warfare. None of them. Amalek sends out an army, a trained army to battle Israel. Israel does not have the weapons of warfare that Amalek has. Is it any wonder that when Moses gets tired, Amalek begins to prevail? It's the trained warriors versus young people who've never fought a battle. But God's not even looking in the valley. God's only looking to see what the elder spiritual people are doing. And when the spiritual people are raising their hands in intercession and warfare, Israel begins to win the battle. The tide begins to turn. That's where the war is won. It's not won in getting a better job or getting more money or, or having a different uh, relationship. The battle is won in the spiritual warfare. He's looking at people who know how to pray, who know how to worship to determine the outcome of the warfare. When Moses grows weary and can't intercede, Israel suffers. We are all responsible for the success of each other. Think about that. You're responsible for the success of your pastor. We're responsible for the success of the teenagers in our church. We're all responsible for each other. God's looking at us to see if we will intercede and pray and worship. Because if we will, he will bring victory in the valley. Number four. A new way of doing something can be helpful and healthy. Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. The New Testament puts the principle this way. Jesus said, for John did not come eating or drinking, and you said, he has a demon. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Sometimes you will never win trying to convince people. Because sometimes God wants us to do it a new way. Can't you just hear someone saying, Pastor Abraham never sat on a rock. Pastor Isaac had never had to have somebody hold up his hands. We don't do that around here that way. You know, it, the method was not holy. The message is holy, not the method. In Mark chapter 7, verses 8 and verse 13, it says this. That when we equate tradition with the word of God, that we nullify the word of God in our life. Now, what does that mean? When I make the method just as holy as the message, I'm really nullifying the power of the word of God in my life. When our traditions become equal with the word of God, when how we do it, becomes as important as the fact that we are doing it. When the method becomes equal to the message, God said, you've missed the mark. Do it a new way. Live by the word, know the word, defend the word, but just don't add to the word of God. Because we serve a God who said, sing a new song. We serve a God who said, I'm going to do a new thing. God always has permission to change the method, but he promised he would never change the message. Now hear me. If we fall in love with old memories, 
we'll never make new ones for the next generation. If we so fall in love with our old memories, we'll never make new ones for the next generation. And now you're talking to, in a way, I'm an old timer in here. I am an old timer in here. I grew up, my, my mom got saved when I was eight years old and we started going to a holiness church. I grew up in a church where if you didn't have your shirt tucked in, you were going to hell. If you sat behind the fourth row, you were a backslider in danger of going to hell. So yeah, all of you in the last two rows of every section, good luck at the judgment. <laughs> I, I grew up in a church where you didn't, you didn't buy anything. You didn't spend money on Sunday. I'll never forget one time we were, as a kid, we were on our way to church. And we, we did not have enough gas to get to church. And we stopped to buy gas. And when my mom got back in the car, I remember her praying, God, forgive me for buying gas on Sunday. I grew up... And a, I got an old-timer's heart right in here, folks. I grew up in that, but I want you to know, here they roll over a stone for Moses to sit on, and they hold up his hands. And you know what? God never said a single negative thing about it. That worked just as well. In fact, it worked better. When it was just Moses doing it, what is the word that the Bible used? Israel prevailed. But when they rolled a stone over and he sat down and Aaron and her joined him in holding up his hands, the Bible says that Israel overwhelmed Amalek. It works better sometimes. Number five is this. And man, I got to fly here. Number five is this. I just say that for y'all's folks' sake. I, I really don't care. Number five. <laughs> Remember, the anointing doesn't erase our humanity. Aaron and Hale, her held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Now here, if you come and hold up my hand, where's your nose going to be? Moses is an 80-year-old man who's been wearing a sport coat or a robe or whatever out in the middle of the sun up on the top of the hill in the desert in August. Maybe. I got a 1 out of 12 chance of being right. But he's out in the sun on the top of the hill, an 80-year-old man. And I got to tell you, they didn't have Axe body spray back then. And I think Moses is perspiring. And I think he is soaked. But if Israel wants to win the battle, Aaron and her are going to have to come alongside and hold up his arms. The anointing doesn't erase our humanity. What does it mean by that? Moses was a man of God, but he also sweated, perspired. And perspiration brings odor. I got a feeling Moses stunk that day. The anointing doesn't make us less human. The New Testament shows us the humanity of every believer. None of us will ever be perfect. Everyone wants to be near the anointing, but it comes at a cost. They were part of the miracle, but to be close to that anointing, to be close to the miraculous, they had to bear the stench of humanity. And every one of us wears flesh, and the stench of our humanity will always come through. We, we tend to measure people by anointing, but God measures people by character. We equate great anointing with great character, and that's not always true. If you want to be near the anointing, you have to be able to bear the stench of humanity. I was a youth pastor for five years with a horrible bunch of teenagers. Twenty-two of them went into the ministry. I sent 22 horrible teenagers to become preachers. There were times 
I wanted to, I love them in the Lord Jesus Christ. But outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, there were times I wanted to kill them. Anybody ever felt like that about somebody else? You know, I love you so much, I want to send you on to meet Jesus <laughs> now. <laughs> but God measures people by character. If you want to fulfill the call of God on your life, Sometimes God will stick you in a junior boys Sunday school class. He'll stick you with people that you just want to have to love in Jesus' name. All the time you're choking them, I love you. <laughs> That's okay. Because the anointing doesn't erase our humanity. And the last thing is this. God's assignment. Pour what you've been given into the life of the next generation. I would call this point, it's not all about you. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. The New Testament puts us this way, follow me as I follow Christ. And then what you have heard me say, teach to other faithful men who can teach it to others. Do you know, as I said, this is the first time that Joshua is mentioned, but God has already chosen him to lead next, and he instructs Moses to pour into his life. Now, there's two things I want you to know about this. There are two guys standing there who could have said, well, what about me? I'm next in line. I was up here on the mountain with you. Who do you think has been holding up your hands these last two hours? But Aaron and Hur never say that. Because what God is doing is telling Moses to pour into the next generation. I want you to know something today. Oh, don't you love that when he closes the book and closes his notes? That's a good sign. <laughs> I want you to know this, that when God pours something into your life, if you don't pour it into the next generation, I believe God will stop pouring it into you. God gives us things in our life. He blesses us in areas of our life so that we can begin to bless others, so we can pour it into the next generation of people. And if we don't, and we hoard it to ourselves, and we don't care enough to get involved with the next generation, I believe that what happens is that in that moment, God said, if you're not going to pass it on, I'm not going to pour it into you. Moses this is the first battle we've won. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go get Joshua and tell him what you've learned in this. I want you to know I'm giving you a promise that I'm going to blot out Amalek. And I want you to go and tell Joshua what the Lord has told you. I want you to pour it into the next generation. You know, this whole thing began with this. God did a miracle for them. And the enemy tried to steal it. But when they began to participate, when they began to pray, when they began to intercede, when they began to say, God, do it however you want to do it. I'm okay with it. Just do it. God's, God brought the victory to them. But then he said, here's your next assignment. Now go pour it into the life of someone else. What the enemy, remember that old song we used to sing, I don't want you to play it, but what the enemy meant for destruction, what the, Joseph said, what the enemy meant for evil, what you meant for evil, God turned it to my good. What the enemy's trying to steal from you, God is saying, I'm going to bless you and give it to you so you can pour it into the life of the next generation. Well, Brother Phil, I'm not good enough to tell somebody else and pour it into their life. Yeah, you are. Because it's not you that you're pouring into them. You're pouring what God has said and what God has done. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, we just thank you right now because you are so good to us. And I believe, Father, you've poured things into the life of people who are in this room and who are watching online this morning. You've poured miraculous provision and supply. You've answered their prayers. You're making a way for them where there seems to be no way. In a way, God, you're...
pouring water out of a rock for them. But the enemy's doing everything he can to steal it from them. He's trying to discourage them, dishearten them, turn them aside, causing them to lose their attention on you, their focus on you. And Father, I pray this morning that you would cause us to see that if we will just participate and be faithful in your plan, if we will pray, if we will read the Bible, if we will intercede, the victory will be ours and you'll help us to pour it in the next generation. This morning, I want to pray specifically for you. I, I know we've got this pandemic thing, so we're going to do our altar call a little different this morning. Here's what I'm going to do. We are in one room. We are one body, one family. So this morning, if you've got a need, you're in a dry place, you're in a pandemic, you need water to flow from the rock. Or God's already provided for you and now the enemy's trying to steal it. If you've got a need, would you just stand right where you're at? I'm not going to ask you to come forward. In one minute, we're all going to stand with you and join with you standing together. But if that's you, would you just stand, join these who are already standing? We're going to believe God to meet your need. We're going to believe God that water is going to flow out of the rock for you today. Praise the Lord. Now, friends, what I want you to do is this. I, I just want you for just a second, you don't need to bow your head. I just want you to look around. And I want you to think of two people who are standing right now. And I want you to say, I'm going to pray for them. Those of you who are standing, I want you to look around and find someone else and say, I'm going to pray for them. Let's all stand together right now. You know, Pastor Brian, one of the things that I have found is that if I need something in my life, if I will sow it, if I will plant it, if I will pray for somebody else who I think needs that same thing, I believe that I all will often reap the blessing of God, the provision of the Lord. So for I've lost about 50 pounds over the last six years. And I want to tell you, my first step in losing that, oh yeah, I, I ate better, I exercised more. But my first step was this, I began to pray for other people who I knew were trying to lose weight. I wanted to plant the seed of prayer in their life, hoping that I would reap the harvest in my own. So while we're here this morning, we're just, and pastor's going to lead us in some song. I want you to just stretch out your hand towards someone who is standing. And we're going to pray right now that God will bring a miraculous provision to them. That the enemy will not be able to steal what the Lord has blessed them with. Can we do that? Just stretch out your hand towards someone right now. Father, in the name, let's all lift up our voices. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray for our brothers and sisters right now. And Father, I pray that you would bring water water out of the rock if necessary. I pray, Father, for these men and women that, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, you would cause a miraculous supply to begin to flow from them. Lord, maybe a new job or financial provision or physical healing or spiritual joy to begin to well up within their soul. Father, we pray that a miraculous supply would be theirs in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you would heal the sick, that you would deliver those who are oppressed, that, Father, you would meet every need. And we stand against the enemy right now who would want to steal the blessing and provision of God from these men and women. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that the enemy would be bound. We pray in the name of the Lord that no weapon formed against us would prosper in Jesus mighty powerful name father we thank you then and we declare that in the name of the Lord and we take authority over the enemy in Jesus name your word said that what we bind here on earth would be bound in heaven and father we in heaven bind the enemy and we bind him here on earth in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ father we thank you for it let's just lift up our voice and thank the Lord together you, Lord. right now can we do that thank you father Thank you for your provision. Thank you for answered prayer. Father, we believe what we have asked for. We believe we will receive it in Jesus' name. And we thank you for that right now, Father, 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Sing this song with us this morning as we close. Praise you. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. This is found, is where you are, where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Lord Jesus, you're my hope and stay When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, you're my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you, my one. I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, you're my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, you're my one defense. You're my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Lord, I just lift up to you, my friends, those that are part of this church. Heavenly Father, you would help them to hold on to you in every circumstance and situation. We know we'll come to dry places, desert places, difficult times. And in those moments, you're likely there working to show us your glory, giving an opportunity for us to call on you and see you work in the miraculous. I pray we'd never 
fear the challenges that come our way as long as we walk connected to you, holding on to your hand. I pray, God, for those that are in the midst of, of, of difficult circumstances right now, I pray they'd find you faithful. I pray for those uh, who, who know those things are on the horizon and that they would, they would get themselves ready, that they would connect themselves to you in deeper and greater ways than ever before as preparation for the battle that lies ahead. I pray for Pastor Phil and his ministry. God, he puts many, many miles on the road, many, many hours serving the churches and the, the ministers and the people of the Illinois district. I pray you would anoint him and we recognize that even as that anointing is on him, that there will be moments when his humanity will be evident. And I pray in those moments that we'd all have the grace to love each other in the way we should and recognize that we belong to you. Lord, use us, we pray. Use us in your kingdom. Let your kingdom be evident in and through us, God. And I pray we'd never fear the things that... Uh, the powers of this, of this present darkness would want us to fear. That as this pandemic ebbs and flows, as people use it for various agendas, that we would not be afraid because we know that the God we serve rules from heaven, that he will never be dethroned, and we can always depend on him to see us through. Hallelujah. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you, church, that he, you will give him, that he will give you his peace, and that peace will be evident to everyone that you meet. God bless you as you go this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.